Okay, sorry, this is part two of that lecture. I was uh, just cut off. Um, so we were talking about how um, the attitude of early Christians was, um, especially monastics and ascetic people, was that even though they may be suffering here on earth, they would get some kind of reward in the afterlife, and their reward for not drinking would be eternal life. And, and of course, avoiding sins and doing other things would add to that. And then they would be allowed to sit on the edge of clouds, look down, and, you know, look at all those people suffering in hell below them. Um, and it's, I think it's even more than Nietzsche made out. I think Freud actually got this correct when he said that this kind of jealousy is not only a matter of spite and creating a virtue out of suffering, but in fact, in, in the end, it ends up turning inward, that the suffering person eventually ends up tormenting themselves and thinking that that's a positive gain. Um, and as we'll see later on, there are some historians, this is a, a historian named Rudolf Bell in a book called Holy Anorexia, argues that the root of all kinds of anorexia comes from a sense of powerlessness in the world. And that's why it's especially young women, especially in a you know patriarchal society where age matters. If you're a young woman, you are, um, you really don't have any power over anything but your own body, really. Um, and his argument is that, that people often uh, control and punish their bodies, especially these, these kind of people. And I think, you know, obviously he's right that anorexia, the root of it, is not a kind of starvation for the sake of beauty, um, but really is a, I think it's true. It's a matter of exerting control. I think his, where his claim falls down is his claim that what a Christian ascetic is doing, what a modern young woman who's an or anyone who's an anorexic are doing are fundamentally the same. I think the, the context is really very important here. And in fact, the, you know, the motivation, the ideas behind it, what actually spurs it on is so completely different that the comparison is almost um, too facile. I think, it, I think you're, you're missing really the point of what, of the, the cultural roots of this phenomenon that would inspire the people to do it, because it's not, pre it's not universal. It's not like every culture comes up with this. And in this case, I think the cultural setting is so different, what the people think they're doing is so completely different that it's not um, really comparable in a, in a meaningful historical way, let's say. Um, nonetheless, it is true that when we get to the Middle Ages, we will see men and women starving themselves for God um, and in avoiding alcohol entirely under the supposition that it is an inherent evil. And I think you'll see that our modern idea, comparable to that in some periods, very comparable, um, really stems back to early Christianity. This is, this is where th that attitude comes from. I would also add, at least among the theologians, their logic is also fundamentally medicinal. I know this sounds sort of weird, but the idea is that food that is very nutritious is qualified in humoral terms as being hot and moist. And too much heat and moisture from food and wine will actually kick your libido into gear. It'll heat, heat you up to the point of wrath, or it will so completely exhaust you that you end up being slothful and not, not being able to do anything. Um, so let, listen to these passages. The once there was a feast in Skate, where they gave a cup of wine to an old man, and he threw it down, saying, Take that death away from me. And when the others who were eating with him saw this, they also did not drink. There, obviously, is becoming inherently evil. And when, and we'll see why in a second, why mona when monasticism spread and the communities got larger, um, obviously, they needed rules, right? They had, they were living their daily lives together in a, in a community, and they needed some way to govern, you know, just to, to eat and, and, you know, live together, basically, peacefully. Um, now, obviously, as Christians, they could not ban wine, right? It's necessary for the, for the mass. I mean, you need wine. You can't do it with something else. Um, and just as they couldn't ban meat, because it's actually, there are passages in the New Testament that say it is explicitly allowed. We're not, we don't have any kosher rules like the Jews did, where they avoid pork and shellfish and things like that. So everything is good food for you, he, they say explicitly. So to ban meat, the idea that it's bad is actually, um, vegetarianism is, is heretical in, in Christianity, technically. Um, but they could, of course, fast more often. They could avoid drinking as much as possible. And even if they, you know, touch it only once every many years, you know, officially declaring it, it's okay, but we don't do it. Um, that would be all right. Um, 
but I think in all fact, you know, just running a practical uh, community of monks required that they have some rules that are maybe not so strict and, and uh, you know, and self-destructive. And I think the, well, the rule that really prevails in the Western tradition was written by uh, St. Benedict. Um, he founded a monastery in Monte Cassino in Italy, and I think he had a very sensible approach to this whole topic. He thought there should be a regular amount of food, you know, specified for every every individual. But there's some cases where you should loosen that rule. In other words, if someone is sick, they might need extra food or better quality. You might have to give them more to drink. Who knows? Um, or what if an important visitor comes? You're not going to want to look really stingy and or insult that person. So there might be an extra dish of food on occasions like that. Um, but but nonetheless, he laid down these rules for um, regular uh, usage in the monastery, and he thought it was necessary to prescribe a certain measure of food and drink. Notwithstanding, having regard for the weakness of the sick, I am of the opinion that a hemina of wine every day will suffice. The hemina is about a, a cup and a half. Let's imagine it's, you know, you have a six ounce cup. This is about nine or ten ounces, somewhere around there. Um, yet it be known to those whom God has granted the gift of abstinence that they shall have a special reward. So it's it's good if you can avoid altogether, but we know monks need to drink. And so let's let's at least limit the, the quantity so no one's going to get drunk, basically. Now, if the, let me read more. If the necessity of place or the hard work or the heat of summer makes them need more, remember, you don't drink water because it's probably bad. Um, there's no you know, filtration system or anything. So wine is the, is for keeping um, um, hydrated, right? So uh, if it's summer, you're going to need a little more wine, right? Because you're, you need more liquid in your body. If they need more, it shall be in the power of the superior to add to the allowance. Yet always with caution that they may not fall into the temptations of satiety, meaning you're not so that they're full of it, or drunkenness. Although we read that wine is never for monks, early ascetics thought that, it is hard to persuade modern monks of this, says Benedict, okay? At least we must all agree that we are not to drink to satiety, but with moderation, for wine makes even wise men fall into apostasy. Now that's dangerous, right? If you drink wine, you may forswear God and say, forget it, I'm not being a monk anymore, this is nonsense. So, um... So you never drink too much, but enough to moisten your body and keep yourself healthy. Um, and note, I think this is this is sort of pretty much conceding that, yeah, there may be extraordinary people out there who can abstain entirely from wine. And that's great. But let's be let's face it, folks. Most people, even those devoted to wine, are going to need some uh, nourishment and refreshment. And and um, and that in his implication is that monks actually in particular like wine a whole lot. Um, and so but a hem and a, and a half will do. And I'll explain why monks like wine a lot in just a moment. Now, we, of course, know lots of people drank much more than that. And oddly, we know also that when the Roman Empire collapsed, the whole infrastructure fell apart. So the market for wine, people who were buying it within the empire or outside, the trade routes fell apart, those connections that go all the way to China. And the vineyards um, largely were neglected and disappeared, or they went wild, which means they you know, don't produce a whole lot and no one is there to you know, crush them and bottle, you know, they don't have bottles yet, but to sell it in a transportable form. So strangely, the people who had to remain um, winemakers, the people who needed to do this, in fact, for the sacrament, are monks and priests, right? They need this stuff. You know, it's, it's not in great quantities, but at least you have to maintain the vineyards and keep pressing. Um, so I would say if anyone in the wake of the fall of the Roman Empire, we're talking 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th century, um, makes wine survive. It's monks. They remember the grafting techniques. Remember, you cut a sprig off of one twig, you put it onto the rootstock of another, and then they connect, and the benefits of having strong roots will produce much more wine and better. Um, so grafting techniques, viticultural techniques, um, and um, methods of trellising, things like that. I mean, all that information from the ancient times, that is kept by monks. They save this stuff, just like they save the ancient texts by copying them out. Um, it's in medieval monasteries that wine is, um, is, is uh, maintained. And let me just give you some names, okay? In fact, the, the most, probably one of the most expensive and famous wines on earth um, 
is uh, a Benedictine monastery, is Gevry Chambertin. That's in Burgundy. So, um, and I think much of the land that is now very famous vineyards within Burgundy, you might not have heard of these names, but they started out as monasteries, okay? They're monastic land to start. So the, I'll give you just some, some examples. The canons of the Cathedral of Autun give you Alox, Pomard, Volnay, Merceau, Chassin, the Cluniac monks, that's um, a, an order that descends out of the Benedictines, uh, have, uh, created the vineyards of Beaune, of Vonay Romanet, the Cistercians of Saint Vivant um, had Romanet and Romanet Conti, really, really great wines today. Those, that's as, you know, as expensive as it's going to get. The Cistercian Abbey of Pontigny grew Chablis, we're still an apple. You know what Chablis is. The Cistercian Abbey of Citeaux had Clos Vougeot. Another really, really extraordinary wine today is is a monastic territory. The Abbey of Bez had Chambertin. The Abbey of Saulieu had Corton Charlemagne. The Cluniac Priory of La Charité sur Loire had Puli Fumé. So, so techniques survive in monastic lands. And strangely enough, what happens is they sell this stuff, right? Um, they, they don't consume it all themselves. They often become quite wealthy. Um, and in fact, it, a, let's say a stereotype arises that some monasteries actually lived really lavishly, eating a lot, very fine food, drinking great wine, neglecting their prayers, keeping concubines, you know, who, whatever it may be. That's the, the image. And whether this is true or not, the perception of laxity leads to this process of constantly reforming orders. People will break out of one monastic order and create a new one that's more austere, punishes themselves in greater ways, weighs hair shirts, um, you know, wakes up at all hours of the night, takes vows of silence sometimes, thing, things like that, just so they aren't in danger of luxury okay, or enjoying their drink. Um, <clears throat> some will, will strike really austere diets. Um, some go out in the middle of nowhere and work. Um, and just recognize that this whole process of breakaway orders trying to be more ascetic and more uh, rigorous than the rich and fat ones, okay? But let's less address this larger question, <laughs> why viticulture would need to be rescued at all, right? Um, it is true that after the Roman Empire, the trade in wine definitely collapsed. Um, but it's also true that the people who tore the empire apart, who broke it, who conquered them, these were all Germanic tribes, um, were not wine drinkers at all, right? So something very interesting happens. These Germanic people come who are beer drinkers fundamentally, and they suddenly find themselves in the land of wine, ruling uh, in these places. Um, these are people, the Visigoths, who end up ruling Spain, the Franks, who end up ruling France, the Saxons, who are in part of northern Germany, and of course later the um, they move into what's now England. Um, these are all beer drinking peoples. Okay? And I guess you could say that once these people settled down and founded kingdoms, the word king is, is a Germanic concept, um, they were happy to drink wine when they could, right? They're, they're willing customers. And they were actually happy to give away land to monasteries that would devote themselves to wine, especially in France. This happens all the time. Um, but elsewhere too, and just to give you an idea of the numbers, I, you know, I threw out a couple of names, but let's give you numbers. Of um, 109 wine appellations, that's the name of a specific vineyard, um, of a specific place, are of monastic origin in France. 45 of them are in Germany, 27 in Austria, 17 in Italy, 12 in Switzerland, 9 in Portugal, 7 in France. There's even 4 in Great Britain that were monasteries. I okay? think you could grow grapes in, the, um, in England, but you, you could actually in the Middle Ages. It was warmer. Um, and as we'll see, later religious orders are also the first to distill wine uh, into aquavit and liqueurs that still ironically bear their names. Um, Chartreuse is a, is a religious order. Um, and of course, Benedictine. You can go into a liquor store and buy a bottle of Benedictine. That's what it's called after St. Benedict, right? So we'll start, and we'll also start to, we'll talk later on how um, abbeys started brewing beer, because you might know they're great Trappist abbeys in Belgium that grew a beer. How did that happen? Well, you know, um, it's a similar story to the, um, to the wine. Uh, so for the, and I think for the early Middle Ages at least, I think because these monasteries and abbeys tried to maintain a simple way of life, they provided a refuge for people, obviously, in very difficult times. They tended to be very industrious, too, especially the working orders, right? So people 
um, in order to gain credit to get into heaven, more or less, they would leave money to these monasteries. So they did often become very wealthy. They bought land. They were landowners. The, your, your landlord could have been a, a monastery. So ironically, as corporate bodies, they had the money and the resources to buy large-scale equipment, to buy land, to buy presses, to um, enough monks around to, to make this stuff. So, so, and they have the manpower, right? So it's, it's ironically, these people who uh, think abstention is a positive ideal, they're the only ones good at making wine on a large scale. The, you know, because they're not shipping it, there's no trade, but, they, but they're selling it locally and making a lot of it. Um, so the other side of the coin is, of course, the majority of any other wine that's being made is on a really small scale, right? Small scale vineyards are what really flourish um, through much of the Middle Ages. Now let's look at the other side of the, the, the border here, right? Let's look at the north. This is an entirely different culture, and we haven't really encountered this at all. Um, first and foremost, this is a beer drinking culture, right? Um, beer and let's say meat also. Meat is just as important. And the values are very different. Remember, it's a heroic culture where masculinity and strength and beauty and prowess is all, is all something that's really valued. Um, if you could drink a lot of beer and eat tons of meat, that's considered virile, right? Um, and these were tribes that lived, first of all, on plunder and pillage. So you had guys around you who were always, you know, into um, drinking and eating and stealing stuff from other people. And, and warfare, right? Their leaders are warrior chieftains, first and foremost. Um, in fact, let me, let me give you some descriptions. The Roman historian Tacitus describes the Germans in this word, with these words. These Roman times, but it's, it's basically the same people. To pass an entire day in night and drinking disgraces no one. Their quarrels, as might be expected with intoxicated people, are seldom fought out with mere abuse, but commonly with wounds and with bloodshed. Yet it is at their feasts that they generally consult on the reconciliation of enemies. So, so even when they're making peace, they drink. On the forming of matrimonial alliances, very important. Remember, it's a compact you're making with a, another group of people who are going to be now your kinfolk. On the choice of chiefs, and finally even on peace and war, for they think that no time is the mind more open to simplicity of purpose or more warm to noble aspirations. Um, in other words, you're going to claim you can do something great when you've had some drink in you. Okay? Keep that in mind. Um, and and he basically says they don't do anything without getting drunk. And it's um, and he says it's just as easy to overcome them with drink as in battle. And of course, we know Tacitus is completely wrong about that. The Romans did not conquer the Germans the other way around. They drew the line here and said, not crossing into this forest, okay, the Teutoburg forest. So let's get a good to get a good sense of what these people are like. You know, this is um, how they drank prodigiously, what it meant to be in their company and drinking um, and telling stories. Let's look at an epic poem written by the Anglo-Saxons. Okay, this is just one group among many um, German peoples. Um, and this is many centuries after Tacitus, of course, but it's still much the same culture that he's talking about. This is the story of Beowulf. Okay? And I want you to keep in mind that this is happening at this same time as all those wonderful things in, in uh, Muslim Baghdad. Okay? They're, they're contemporaneous. And it may re seem really strange that these two cultures on opposite ends of the world actually did um, interact. They, they clash in battle, for example. Um, think of the Battle of Tours in central France, that's 732, when the Umayyad general Abdul Ramad comes up from Spain, which had already been conquered, and um, meets the Franks under Charles Martel. Martel means the hammer. And there's, it's a great battle of tour where the Islam is stopped, basically. Um, and the other interaction is really kind of weird. I've heard all my life that the great um, uh, Hagia Sophia, which is the Byzantine cathedral in what was then Constantinople, uh, it's now a great, the great mosque in Istanbul, I read that it had these ruins by this guy, this Viking, who got there and scratched his name in the banister up on the galleries. And I was just there a couple of months, and, and it's a month ago, and it's there. It's actually these this Viking um, ruins. So, so I'm saying this just to bring to your attention that where we are chronologically in the course that at, at, that the uh, Omar Khayyam and Beowulf are within a century or so 
from each other. So let's talk about Beowulf, a heroic poem written in Old English. It takes place in Scandinavia. Um, the setting is a mead hall where Hrothgar, who is the king of the Schildings, and his thanes, a thane is a knight, the people who follow him around, they're being terrorized by a monster whose name is Grendel. Okay? And Beowulf, who is the head of, a, of the Geats, comes to their rescue and will slay the monster for them. Okay? Now, what is this hall? The hall is a big wooden longhouse. This is where all this stuff takes place, where the warlord entertains his thanes. They fight for him. He feeds them and gives them drink. Okay? It's, a, it's a dependency um, relationship. And in the language, in Old English, um, the word is sail. Okay? And it's in German, a sal, in Icelandic, salur. It means hall. Okay? I'm not sure if it's connected to the word salon, but a sal or sal in French is the same word. Um, so but the hall we're talking about here is Herot, the foremost hall under heaven. And the site of this has actually been identified. It's, it's Leire in Denmark. Okay? So we know the thing actually took place. This is Hrothgar. It burns in his spirit to urge his folk to found a great building, a mead hall grander than men of the era. He is eager to build a great hall in which he may feast his retainers. Retainer is your followers. Okay? Ever had heard of, and in, share, and in it to share with young and old of the blessings the Lord had allowed him, save life and retainers. Then the wor work I find afar was assigned to many races in Middle Earth's regions to adorn the great folk hall. In due time it happened early among men that was finished entirely the greatest of hall buildings. Heorot he named it. The hall is completed and it is called Heort or Heorot, who wide reaching word sway wielded among arrow men. <laughs> love that language. That's obviously a modern translation, right? I'll show you what Old English sounded like in a moment. Um, so in the Great Hall, what goes on there is it's the, the chieftain's duty is to entertain, to provide drink for his soldiers, and their duty is to fight by his side, and they get part of the whatever they steal, right? So in the course of a feast, there's also a speaker. There's a scope, or a bard is the modern uh, equivalent, who would be accompanied by a harp. He would recite by memory these long narrative poems about the stories of the ancestors and, you know, and there, there are a lot of these that survive. Njal saga, you know, there are Icelandic sagas that are very closely related to the Norse Vikings that get taken to Iceland. Um, but here the whole idea is that you challenge other people to outdo you. You, you boast about what you can do. You drink, the more, more you drink, the better. And, and then you, um, you get, inspired to do things of great bravery <laughs> because you're you're drinking right so apparently their guys are doing this making a whole lot of noise and grendel the monster gets angry busts into the hall tears stuff up and eats some soldiers okay um and uh they all the guys in the wake of this boast about what they're gonna do but actually they can't do anything about grendel Oft drunken with beer, my thanes have made many boasts, but have not executed them. Or the ale vessel promised warriors in armor, they would willingly wait on the wassailing benches and grapple with Grendel. They're drunk and they're saying, I'll get that guy, I'll get him, with grimmest of edges. Then this mead hall at morning with murder was reeking. The building was bloody at breaking of daylight. The bench deals all flooded, dripping and bloodied. The folk hall was gory. I had fewer retainers, dear beloved warriors whom death had lain hold of. All these guys had boasted. Monster came back and ripped them to shreds and ate them. So <clears throat> all this keeps going on until Beowulf shows up and he promises to kill the monster. Um, and note you can't make a boast unless you've got a drink in hand and you pledge I'm really going to do this. I'm not just kidding. I'm not just, uh, you know, pulling your leg. There, warlike in spirit, they went to be seated, proud and exultant. A liegeman did serve, who a beaker embellished, bore with decorum, that's ceremony, and the gleeman sings and gleeman drinking poured. The gleeman sang Willom. The heroes all joyced together, hardy in Herat. There was heroes rejoicing, a numerous war band of waiters and Dane men the Danish and the other people are going to join him. And, and Beowulf says, I promise I'm going to go get that monster. 
So the ceremony that fall, that happens here, or, there, or uh, I think it's at this point, is uh, the queen is the one who passes the cup around. And I, I'd like to imagine a big drinking horn. We don't know what it is, the cup. But the king drinks it first. And then he passes it around to everyone else according to rank. Think of this. I want you to wonder why. Um, and But it's a pledge, obviously. Um, they're promising to support each other. The drink confirms that it's true. It's just like drinking at a wedding, drinking when you sign a contract, anything. I promise to be head to uh, follow you into battle and death if necessary. What is fascinating is that it's the woman of the household who initiates this. She's probably the one who made the beer, right? So, but she is the keeper of the household, the serves the food, who, um, it's not the man. It's actually the woman here, which is very interesting. I think it's also... <clears throat> kind of interesting in this story that there is also wine. Um, it would definitely, obviously, it's imported. They can't grow wine in Denmark. But it seems like whenever anyone's drinking wine in this story, things go bad. In fact, after Grendel is killed, they drink wine and then they get his mother, the monster's mother comes to get them and she's much worse than Grendel. Um, and there are other occasions in the story when people get drunk, but it's always on wine. It's, it seems weird. That it's like sort of mead and beer are the happy local drinks that, that are good for Saxons. But, the, um, but wine is imported and weird and everything goes wrong when people drink wine. Um, but in fact, the, the point is, of course, beer is local and it's equated with homeland and with happiness and drinking in large quantities. And of course, when guests come, you offer them your local beer, right? Your brew that you've not been made in, in the back. This is, you know, you can't buy this stuff. You've got to make it. Um, and most importantly, toasting your guests and your host is essential, integral to warrior society. And I want to, you know, I want you to think about this and compare it, of course, to the Confucian example we had just a while ago. Um, and, um, and what's very interesting also is the, is that the, um, the gods in Viking myths all drink prodigiously. <laughs> okay. That's very, they, you remember people make gods in their own image, right? So, um, but let's let's read a little passage. Um, this is not from Beowulf. This is a riddle. Okay, it's it's tenth century. It's from the uh, Exeter book, is what it's called, and it's called the um, riddle. Well, it's riddle twenty five. But I want you to hear what it sounds like first. Okay, in Old English, this is the ancestor of our language. Ik eum werth werum we defunden, brungen ab berwum and ab burgelothum. Ob denum antum donum deges men wegon fethra on lifte feredon mit liste under hrufs chlio haleth mech sithan beth dan in bidena nu eki om bindera ox windera sona werpa esne ot orthan huilum eldne siorl. Now, that is, no, it's not, it shouldn't sound as serious as I'm reading it. I'll read you it in English now. It's a riddle, think. I am man's treasure, taken from the woods, cliff sides, hill slopes, valleys, downs. By day, wings bear me in the buzzing air, slip me under a shelf, sheltering roof, sweet craft. Soon a man bears me to a tub. Bathed I am binder and scourge of men, bringing down the young, ravage the old, sap the strength. Soon he discovers who wrestles with me, my fierce body rush I, roll fools flush on the ground, robbed of strength, reckless of speech, a man knows no power over hands, feet, and mind. Who uh, am I who bind? Men of Middle Earth, blinding with rage, fools know my dark power by daylight. Okay, so well, when we come back um, to discuss this, I'm going to ask you, what is this thing he's talking about, this riddle? Um, okay, so um, I'll see you next time. <laughs>